Uh, hi, my name is Landon Harvey. Uh, welcome to Landon Live. I'm here with comedian, ventriloquist, Mark Merchant. Mark, how are you doing today? I'm happy. I'm happy to be alive. I'm happy to be safe. I'm happy to be performing. Fantastic. Yeah, we're happy to have you on. So, uh, Mark, go ahead and tell us how you got into show business. Because I'd love to hear every every different performer story on this. I got into show business like like a lot of people who are ventriloquists who are the age that I am uh, by listening to the Jimmy Nelson record all about instant ventriloquism, which I got when I was ten years old. I started doing oh, magic. Right. I started doing magic when I was eight years old. Mm -hmm. But the first performer that I saw live, a man named Clem Fortner, did magic and ventriloquism, and so I thought they went together. So when I was eight, I got a little magic kit from Santa Claus and, and mm -hmm. it really was Santa Claus. I'm certain. What in my mom? Yeah. No. And then when I was 10, I remember my dad said, I think Santa Claus might bring you something that you would use in your career. And he didn't know it actually would become my career at age 10, but I got the little Danny O'Day doll with oh, wow. string on the back of the neck and the, uh -huh. record, the record by Jimmy Nelson, instant ventriloquism which had one side was an actual ventriloquism course and it's a great course. And the other side was so much fun. It had the lines of the character, the dummy, the figure, whatever you want to call the alter ego. And wow. Jimmy Nelson would say, put the record player behind the chair and then you could sit there with your Danny O'Day dummy and you could be doing your act and you would have perfect lip control because the, characters lines were all on the record and there were enough <laughs> gaps on the record where you would go hello i'm mark merchant and then the puppet would go hi i'm danny o'day and your lips would be like that. that that's actually the same way that darcy lynn does it i i shouldn't reveal that but oh really yeah. wow <laughs> i'll get singing to my act then wow. i'll get in trouble for that and you've got it <laughs> by the way landon i have seen you at the ventriloquist convention and you are a force with which to be reckoned. Uh, as I said to you, oh, well, thank you. <laughs> when we were in high school and we're doing independent study, I said, I know one day you're going to be a big star, and I will have been retired by then, and I'll be coming backstage, and I'll go. I'm Mark Merchant. I'm a friend of Landon Harvey, and you'll know what Definitely. to do. Security. <laughs> <laughs> so that 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 was my first taste of ventriloquism. Ten yeah. years old. I continued to do magic and ventriloquism. By the when I was 13, I met an Atlanta magician, professional magician, still working, named David Ginn. He had just graduated from University of Georgia, degree in journalism, and he saw that there was a modicum of talent in me, and he let me go with him to shows. And I, at that point, I really developed my magic, and I, I wasn't doing as much ventriloquism. But by the time I started doing shows for pay, which is when I was 13, like doing a birthday party for $10, sure. $15. Sure. The last cruise ship I was on, by golly, I'm, I'm up to $17.50. So, you know, things, things are looking good. But I started doing shows and my mom and dad, God bless them, Peggy and Sherwood Merchant, they would drive me to birthday party shows, shows at Kiwanis clubs, church parties, in any any show I could get. And finally, I was getting like $20, $25 a show, which was a lot better than flipping burgers at the Dairy Queen. Which yeah, I love it. I, I love uh, being a ventriloquist because it kept me from having a real job, especially in high school. While all the my friends are working at Sonic, I'm doing a, a kid's birthday show on the weekend and they're, you know, making jokes about me for it. And I tell them what I make and they're like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I'm sure in this day and age, Landon, because you're very good. When you were doing a kid's birthday party, you probably were making a little bit more than fifteen dollars. I mean, we're a going bit back, more. We're going back to nineteen sixty-eight, sixty-nine. Yeah. So, so how old are you during? How old were you during this time that you were developing your your skills as a magician and a ventriloquist? Were you a teenager? My, my, my teenage years, from thirteen, okay. from thirteen to about eighteen. Okay, awesome. Uh, we have uh, in the comments we have uh, Richard Force. Hello, Landon. Hi, Richard. Welcome. Um, uh, Kimberly said, "Fascinating." It is. Uh, welcome, uh, David Fowler um, uh, and, and Grayson and uh, Kimberly that have joined in with us. Um, so, Mark, you uh, <laughs> you you do the cruise ship, uh, uh, correct? You do cruise ships. Yeah, cruise ships, cruise ships have been 
in my career of 42 years, cruise ships have been the biggest client that I've had. But I've I've also done uh, a lot of casinos, a lot of corporate sure. dates, but cruise ships have been they have been the biggest source of my income. So how do you go from this kid that does half magic, half ventriloquism blend to uh, this uh, this polished cruise line performer act that that is a staple to that cruise line? How do you how do you go from? Well, it 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 wasn't it certainly wasn't like that. Right. When I was in college uh, at uh, Georgia State University, I pretty much paid my tuition by doing shows. By that time, I was doing more shows at civic organizations, and I I would send out mailers. I, I would get addresses from the Chamber of Commerce and, and mail out mailers to Kiwanis clubs, Rotary clubs, company parties. And I was doing a show that was like 45 minutes long, about 30 minutes of magic and about 15 minutes of ventriloquism. But something happened my freshman year in college that really crystallized for me that this is what I was going to do for a living. I auditioned for a USO tour. Uh, the USO is that organization that does shows around the world at military bases for the men and yes. women of the armed forces. Mm -hmm. And there was a talent audition in Atlanta, Georgia, the USO seeking performers to go on a USO tour, five week tour of Europe to American military bases. It was originally going to go to Vietnam, but mm -hmm. fortunately the Vietnam war ended. So I was 18 years old. I went auditioned and mm -hmm. I did, I didn't do any magic. I did my ventriloquism act and wow. I did some jokes right out of Jimmy Nelson's second album. You know, his second album had some comedy routines on it. Mm -hmm. And I had the figure that I had at the time I bought from George Schindler. He has a uh, company called Showbiz Comedy Service in New York. In fact, okay. George, George runs the annual vent orama at Abbott's Magic Convention every summer oh. in, in Colon, Michigan. Colon, Michigan is right next to Bladder, Michigan, but that's a different story. <laughs> so I bought this figure and he was, he, the puppet was a Pelham puppet. It had wild hair and it did not have a body. I took the head and just stuck it in the body of my second ventriloquist figure that was still not a professional figure. It was basically a figure from FAO Schwartz. It was like a modified okay. Jerry Mahoney, just a head with a, all that moved was a mouth. Well, that head right. put in the body and I went and got him a hipper suit. And so when I auditioned for this USO tour with Snurdly Covington, that was my puppet's name, Snurdly Covington, S-N-U-R-D-L-E-Y Covington. Uh, my friend, wow. magician David Ginn helped me coin that name. And so on this did USO- you, I, Did you have him introduce himself? <laughs> I did. I did have him introduce himself. Yes, he would. I would bring him out. We're not Snurdly Covington. Hi. My, my falsetto voice was a little better then. At age 65, your falsetto was a little more difficult to produce because you're both. <laughs> so I went to this USO tour audition and thank you, God. I, I came in first place. I won the showmanship award and I did some jokes that were right out of that Jimmy Nelson routine. I had the puppet and there were a lot of military people there. I remember this was 1972 Landon. Yeah. And my puppet said, Oh, look, I see a lot of windy soldiers. And I said, Snurdly, what are windy soldiers? And he said, draftees, you know, cause the draft was still active then. And that got a big laugh. And one of the judges was a second Lieutenant. And, uh, and, and she was in the women's army Corps. A WAC, W A C, that's what it's called. And yeah. and I another this joke came right out of the Jimmy Nelson record. I mean, I was I was 18 years old. I said, Snurdly, you know, that lady right there, she's a whack. And Snurdly said, What? I said, She's a whack. And he goes, Really? I got an uncle who's a little goofy too, which <laughs> <laughs> which got a laugh. And I said, No, she's in the women army corps. And she's a second lieutenant. You know what that means? And Snurdly said, yeah, the first one got away, which that was my joke. <laughs> and that's great. The, you just have them stacked on top of each other. And I, I had to do like eight minutes. And when they started giving out the prizes, and I, I remember Landon, when I went to this audition, 
Mm -hmm. The girlfriend I had at the time of a young lady named Debbie, Debbie Leathers was her name. I told Debbie, I said, I think this is a great opportunity, but I feel like I haven't prepared as much as I, as I should have prepared. I, I hope that I don't blow this. Well, uh, proving that sometimes the show business gods and the real God line up. Yeah. And I, I mean, there was a singer who won, uh, there was a band, a bluegrass band. There was how many winners could there be? I mean, is it, and how many people like audition or sign oh, up for this? There were probably Landon at that, at that show. I bet there were probably 40 people and it was a long show because the, as you know, having been to the ventriloquist convention, mm -hmm. you're supposed to keep, you know, open mics and auditions to like five or six minutes, but some people would go over. But I think, I think the, the evening went on about three hours and it ended wow. up with me, Mark Merchant. It ended up with a singer named Eddie Bowen who could do a great Elvis Presley. It ended up with four gentlemen called the Bluegrass Band. So that was, let's see, that was six. They only had one girl which was, that was a mistake in my opinion, sending a USO show to uh, military bases with only one girl. She was a world champion baton twirler. She went to Georgia Tech University and she wow. twirled batons for the Georgia Tech uh, band. Mm -hmm. and, and she was great, but she also, she was a very pretty girl, but she was kind of an early feminist and nothing wrong with feminism, but she did not like it when men whistled at her. Now, yeah. guess what, 1973 USO tour, military bases guys but I'm, were, I'm sure i'm sure they were whistling at the baton work uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes yes they were yeah. see see you are very smart and then and then the other the other person was uh, a man named oj harris and he was an interpretive dancer he did interpretive african dances he was very good as a dancer but it was mm -hmm. a kind of a weird act to send on a uso tour so Probably, so probably. kind of to see where you are on this timeline, are you, so you're like in your like, what, like 18. 17, like 19, 18, 18. Okay. You're, you're 18 in this and all the other acts, are they like around your age or are they, they're much older? I mean, just to see kind of the difference. No, they, they were, they were all college students. I think some of them may have been a couple of years older than me, but I, I think I was actually the youngest. I think the others were like, uh, I was a freshman in college. I think the rest of them were sophomores. And I remember when, after we won and we were standing there and the gentleman from the USO who was saying, okay, you've all got this trip to Europe, but what are you going to do about school? What are you going to do about this quarter of school? And, and, and in unison, we all said, we'll take off a quarter, you know, <laughs> 1973 wow. to get an opportunity to go. First of all, I knew I was going to get to perform. Second of all, I, the fact that I was serving my country in a way that I was going to military bases and entertaining people who were in the military, who most of them at that time were there because they got drafted. So that, that was good. So the, the age range was from 18 to, I probably the oldest person was 20. I think the, I think the dancer, uh, OJ Harris, who went to Moore, Morehouse College, I think he may have been about 20 years old. And yeah. they were going to have the singer, Eddie Bowen, be the master of ceremonies. And at the first rehearsal where we were just spitballing as they say the show what were we going to do eddie bowen said i don't want to be the mc and he pointed to me he said mark merchant should be the mc and i'm like yeah i love being the mc because you get to bring on the acts and and i i do it well with all modesty and so that allowed me to do one little spot of magic comedy magic and one spot of ventriloquism and the others I, I would get on stage and just, I had to kill a little time while the band would set up. And that, that was invaluable experience, Landon, to be in front of audiences and, and USO tours, military audiences are great audiences because they're very appreciative. Mm -hmm. But, but then sometimes we would arrive at some base on the outskirts, some rural place in Germany, like almost on the border of Czechoslovakia and small base, they would be showing a movie and they would have to stop the movie because, sorry guys, we've got a USO show coming. <laughs> Sometimes they wouldn't be the, the happiest about that, but we- So had you, ha um, had you done any MC work before this or was this the first time you had MC'd anything? I had done MC work as 
in, in high school, especially my junior and senior year of high school, I emceed a lot of beauty pageants, high school beauty pageants okay. and, and school assemblies. And also in my freshman year in college, my major was broadcast journalism. So I was already working oh. at the college radio station. So yeah. it's, it's a people like you and me who love performing. You, you put a microphone in front of us and it's like, hello, how are you? Good to see you. <laughs> yeah. So that was the MC work I had done. And, and people always told me that I was good at it. And I appreciated that because I, I was quick on my feet. And if there was a, if there was a glitch or something, say one of the beauty contestants, their, their gown had ripped or something, I was always able to wing it and ad lib something. So, yeah. I, and, and I liked, I liked being the MC because one, it gave me more stage time Two, it, 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 I thought that it was good to bridge the show together. And I remember as we were putting the show together, like who was, what act was going to go. And as the, as the climax number of the show where everybody in the cast, me, the singer, the bluegrass band, the dancer and the baton twirler would all come out. The song we all came out to, <laughs> this was my idea was the Janis Joplin song. Oh Lord, won't you buy me? A Mercedes Benz. My friends all drive Porsches. I must make amens. And everybody would take a verse. And me with my snurdly Covington would go, Darling, four dollars is trying to find me. I wait for delivery. Well, that's pretty good lip control. And have yeah. you ever even heard that song? Uh, oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? This is the first time I've heard it. So. <laughs> but I, I'm young, so you you are young. But man, you look great on camera, and and I realize you've got a nice high back chair behind you. And, and I thank you for the wow, the cool uh, thing of the cruise ship. Unfortunately, it's a yeah. Costa ship, but that's okay. But for a while, the the back of your chair, I thought Landon's wearing a cape. <laughs> <laughs> it looked like you had a towel. Like okay, now, <laughs> I see you. Yeah, I, uh, I, I moonlight as a cartoon villain. Um, Steve E said, um, I, rem uh, uh, I remember seeing Paul Winchell at a USO show, and he also said, as a veteran, we loved USO shows. So that's awesome. Um, Kimberly uh, Seguina said, wow, that must have been a blast. Yeah, it, sa it sounds super neat. Um, so from going, so this was uh, through a, you said five week span? It you was did five, these? Five, a five Five and a half. It ended up being almost six weeks because, as we know from what's going on in the world now, a lot of things can happen in the world in that time. And when I was on this USO tour, uh, let's see, two big important things happened. One, the Paris Peace Accord was signed, so the Vietnam War officially ended. So that that put a lot of shows like where we were supposed to be doing a show at a military base. Suddenly, that base was being used for a big you know, patriotic pep rally because the war was over, which was a better sure. thing than a USO show. And also during that time, the uh, past president, immediate past president of the United States, Lyndon Johnson, died in January of 1973. So that that made some of the military bases close their activities because the flags were at half staff. So we ended up we ended up being there six weeks instead of five weeks. And when we were in the Azores, which is a island off the a chain of islands off the coast of Portugal, where there is an American military base, we ended up staying there probably four days longer than we were supposed to. And we ended up doing like three extra shows. And but I don't think people tired of us because at least they didn't tire of me because I thought if I'm doing a show for the same audience, I'm going to try to come up with some different material. It wasn't always great material, but they weren't getting the same thing from me. And I, I always tried to keep it clean, even though it was a military audience. And, and they were, as the veteran commented, they were very appreciative. And it was such a great training ground. And I, I'm proud to say out of that group of entertainers, the only one who continued at entertainment, who is a professional entertainer to this day, is me. Wow. So I had I had a great time and I've I've done a couple of USO things since, but never of that magnitude. I'm 
I'm not I'm not a a rich and famous entertainer, and that's all that the USO wants to take <laughs> our rich and famous entertainers. Well, what, I, what I love when you, yeah, as I say in my show, I didn't get in show business to become rich and famous, and it's worked out perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> What I love about when you talk, yeah, you know, talking about how you did MC work for the USO shows is how, um, from from an audience po point of view, seeing you come out, introduce yourself, and then uh, throughout the show, seeing the different types of, um, you know, you did magic, you did ventriloquism, you probably did some some stand up jokes, and getting to see your character evolve through the different acts must have been neat too, as, as just watching you as the MC, um, your from your, your the audience point of view. That's, it, that's really neat. It was, Landon, and I learned quickly within one of my first two or three, probably my first two shows, mm -hmm. my first two shows, I came out with my character right away. And then I realized I was, I was, I was burying the, the, the heart of the story. I, I, I would come out, the band would be playing, and I would come out and say, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, the band would be playing some vamp. Welcome to a Georgia Jamboree, sponsored by the USO and the city of Atlanta. We feature the bluegrass band, the song stylings of Eddie Bowen, the amazing dance of O.J. Harris, and the lovely Dawn Carrico with her dancing batons. I'm your host and MC for the evening, Mark Merchant. And the band, and then I would come on and I would do a couple of jokes. I, I learned, let them know you. As I always yeah. say, when I've coached a few ventriloquists, and Russ Lewis, Russo Lewis, a great ventriloquist, he yeah. told me one time when he saw me at a, a nightclub show, he said, Mark Merchant, don't forget, that's a character on your right hand, that's a character on your left hand, but you are a character. You need to be part of the show too. So mm -hmm. so yeah, that was, you hit the nail on the headland and to be able to go out and introduce myself and then I would do, I've always been a better ventriloquist than magician, I'm, mm -hmm. but the comedy magic was fun when I would do my first spot, I would do like one comedy trick and I would get somebody out of the audience and I forgot what sure. I, I forgot the trick that I would do. And then I would introduce the next act and then I would come on with my ventriloquism. And because I had done me and then magic and then the ventriloquism. And that's, that's where I, to me, that's where I shone. And my dad, Sherwood Merchant, God rest his soul. He told me probably one of my last years in college, he said, you know, Mark, you really should focus on the ventriloquism because I can tell you really come alive when you do that. I liked doing magic and I liked mm -hmm. entertaining with magic, but I like comedy and I'm just, I like being a ventriloquist. So yeah. that, that's how I ended up focusing on that. But there's, there's another story to that, but I'll, I'll let you talk because this is your story. Well, what was interesting, because I'm curious, um, typically when you see, you know, when you're learning to be a ventriloquist, you learn the role of, you're the straight man and the puppet is the one that that makes you mad or that that gets in, you into all these circumstances or or gets the punchline how have you um made it to where the audience can understand your character divorced from the puppets i know that you talked about coming out and then introdu introducing the puppet before you bring it out um but do you sometimes give yourself the punchlines or is it the puppet always gets the punchlines but you also make make your own your own you know side things to the puppet how have you dealt with that from a writing perspective from a writing perspective especially recently i i have found that that i i come out with a when i do a one-man show in a community or a theater i come out with a character but the character is not talking the character is animated but i am delivering the lines and the first few jokes are all me so that i establish myself as a performer and then the character comes to life but still a few times in my routine now regardless of which character i have with me i make sure that i give myself one of the punchlines, especially when it when it feels more natural sometimes to, and, and jimmy nelson uh, the great late great jimmy nelson he he told me at the ventriloquist convention in 2001 when i was part of the saturday night show and M i wasn't the mc i was just part of it Jimmy Nelson, he said, Mark, you're great. You've got great technique. He said, but remember, this is what Jimmy Nelson said. He said, the old style of straight man comic, straight man comic, he said, that's old style. He said, you need to develop your character more. Yeah. That was in 2001. And I've, I've strived to do that. And when, I'm, when I've been working on cruise ships or wherever, and someone will come up to me and say, 
you're really funny and I jo enjoyed your show. And, you know, you really don't even need the puppets. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I do need the puppets. But the fact <laughs> that I don't lets me know that, hey, maybe I'm doing something right here. Well, I love I've I've um, gone through some of your YouTube clips. And what I love is um, I think I had seen a uh, a performance you did for a like a women's club or organization and you used your character uh, Zelda. And what I love about uh, your 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 style, I guess you would say about performing is that you've got this um, radio announcer voice. And so when you deliver the setup, it sounds so um you know, normal and so cleaned. And then when the puppet delivers the punchline, there's such of a contrast. And then of course, Zelda is a woman character. And so there's even more contrast there. And you've got, you know, different inflection in her voice. And it just, it, the the contrast is, is what really um, helps that comedy. So it's really, thank really a neat thing. Thank you. I think, I think you might be talking about the YouTube clip. Was that the one where Zelda is wearing a nurse's hat? I believe so. That was, that was my mother who will be 89 years old tomorrow. Happy birthday, Peggy, if you're wow. watching this. My mom, yeah, happy birthday. Yeah, she'll be 89 April the 26th. I'm, and I know you're syndicating this to, this is going on Netflix probably and Amazon and every place. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, right after the uh, the whole tiger thing on Netflix, they wanted a documentary for uh, another niche thing. So I'm sending in all the ventriloquist stuff I can find. A tiger thing, yeah. I got my stimulus check yesterday, and I went right out and bought myself a tiger cub. He's in, the, <laughs> he's in the backyard. My wife won't let me bring him in because he's already killed a couple of people. But yeah, Zelda, Zelda had on the nurse's hat because it was my mother's like, holy cow, what was it? Like the 70th or 65th anniversary of her graduating class from nursing school. Wow. And so... Uh, that was that was so much fun and i was able to customize some of the material about some of the people there sure was it kind of daunting or were you kind of nervous about performing for your for your mom and her friends because i i know that some people feel weird when they're performing for family no no my, my family is has always been supportive of me even mm -hmm. even when they haven't been supportive of me because they've always known that that this is this is what makes me tick this is if, if you are a performer and you've got the need to do this, I mean, this, I feel like the world will come out of this COVID-19 problem that we're in but as, as one who makes a living performing, but also has a true passion for performing. Landon, if suddenly I hit the lottery tomorrow, which would be really weird because I don't buy a ticket, but if I, if I hit the lottery, and had unlimited funds, I would still want to perform. I, I think I probably would buy a theater and say, look, I'm gonna perform. I mean, when you're the kind of person who enjoys the laughter and, and somewhat enjoys, well, you've got it too. I've seen you perform at the convention. You're great. You, okay. you enjoy a little bit of being the center of attention and, and yeah. having people look at you saying, look at me. When, when I went to the grocery store, I'm the designated person in my family that, that risked my life to go out and get groceries for my lovely wife and I. And I don't know if you saw the thing on Facebook, but I wore an official gas mask that I got. I had, I, yeah, I had seen that. When I was in Saudi Arabia. And uh, when you wear a gas mask, people will one, socially distance you at an extreme, or two, they'll laugh like crazy, or three, They'll say, what is wrong with you? And any of those reactions is okay with me. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, it's neat to see all the creative things people are, are uh, that are coming out of this um, time of, uh, of self-quarantine, whether it's, you know, working on, on new projects or even just developing a different different uh, way to make a mask. Um, so, it's, so you did these USO tours. What was, what, um, what, did you do something in between that and then getting into the, the cruise ship market? Um, yes, I, I, I finished my degree in broadcast journalism at University of Georgia, or pardon me, Georgia State, part of the university system of Georgia. And I was doing shows the whole time. Sometimes the, the mail outs that I would send out would get me, sometimes I was getting $150, $200 for a show, which that would be, Back then, in college in 1974, 1975, that was a, a lot of money. Yeah. And it, it would pay tuition. Mm -hmm. 
I was still working in radio. I, I worked back at the college radio station and I also worked at a commercial radio station. I, I always thought that radio might be my career because I, I really love, I, I really love being on the radio, mm. but I was doing shows and then Landon, and this is one of those things I look back at my life and I think, what was I thinking? Uh, I went to dental hygiene school. I, I, I hadn't finished my journalism degree yet. I had two quarters to go. And then I enrolled in a community college, Clayton Junior College, and started studying how to clean teeth because I'd always thought maybe I could go to dental school. And it's one of the things in my life that I, I think, why was I doing that? Probably the reason I was doing it is my girlfriend at the time was in the class above me. And I thought I can do that. And she said, I don't think you could learn how to clean teeth. And I did. And I got a degree. Like challenge accepted. <laughs> I got a degree. And I am still to this day, I keep my license up. I am a registered wow. dental hygienist. And I I only did that. Thank you, God. I only cleaned teeth for five months. It was when I first started doing it for a living, I thought, yeah, this is great. And then in the middle of that five, not did I say five weeks, five months, in the middle of those five months, I already had one week of shows booked at a shopping mall in Atlanta, a high end shopping mall, perimeter mall, where I was the, I wasn't doing any ventriloquism. I was just the MC of a, literally a Disney show. I was the Mouseketeer MC. Oh, wow. I wore a Mickey Mouse t-shirt, Mickey Mouse ears, and I would introduce Mickey, Goofy, and Pluto, who the characters are not allowed to speak. And for that, I think I was paid $450 for the week, which was a lot more than cleaning teeth. And I think it landed, that absolutely derailed my dental hygiene career because I thought, why am I wasting my time cleaning teeth? Because this is what my passion is. And when I was in dental hygiene school, it's a two year program. I got through the first year and I didn't let anyone know I was a performer. That's, that's the truth. I was, I was the only guy in the class. So wow. I just, amazingly, I kept my mouth shut. I kept my head down. I did what I was supposed to do. At the end of the first year, someone in the class said, well, the class above us is graduating. We should do some party for them and maybe we should get some entertainment. And I said, well, I know somebody who could come and do a show. I know of, this is the truth. I know a ventriloquist, a friend of mine, and he would charge a hundred dollars. Well, guess who that ventriloquist is? Me. Yeah. So I got my act together and I came and I did my show for the class and I did my, and this was a real teachable moment, Landon. The head of the dental hygiene department, a retired army dentist named Dr. Leonard Schreiber, at the end of the show, he took me aside and he said, Mr. Merchant, why are you wasting your time in dental hygiene? This is what you should be doing. This is what makes you tick. And I said, well, thank you. And it was a real confidence booster. But I said, but Dr. Schreiber, I don't want to quit dental hygiene school. I've only got a year to go. He goes, I'm not suggesting you quit. I'm just saying you ought to pursue this. And I said, well, you know, I've got to finish dental hygiene school. And, and I kid you not, Landon, he looked at me and he shook my hand. Remember when you could shake hands and didn't have to bump elbows? He shook my hand and he said, Mr. Merchant, stay in dental hygiene school. I'll make sure that you pass. Now, that didn't mean that he gave me a card uh -huh. block, that I didn't have to do my work. Mm -hmm. I didn't do my work. But I knew in the clinicals when I was cleaning somebody's teeth and he would come and grade, he would stick the mouth mirror in their mouth and he would say, great job, Mr. Merchant, 100. And he would kind of he would kind of give me without giving me a wink. He would let me know. I know you're never going to do this for a living, but I <laughs> did do it for a living for five months. But after oh. in the middle of that, when I had that one week where they let me off to do that gig that I had, my interest in dental hygiene went way down. And I was I was just not happy. And then one day. I was cleaning somebody's teeth at Dr. Connor and McDevitt's office. It's called an oral prophylaxis, which means prevention of oral disease. I was cleaning their teeth 
And the office manager came and said, Mr. Merchant, your mother's on the phone. Now, my mother's a nurse. This was 1978. I knew my mother wouldn't call me unless it was something important because she knew I worked in the health field. And I went, I said to the patient, I'll be right back. And I stuck that thing in their mouth. <laughs> and I went and I said, hey, mom. And she said, Mark, somebody, somebody named Mike Nett from Carnival Cruise Lines is called and wants to offer you a job entertaining on the Mardi Gras. And he gave me the number. And the reason, Landon, that they even had a contact for me is I had been sending an article in the News Events magazine that was published by Mayor Ventriloquist Studios, had a little blurb, Carnival Cruise Lines is looking for variety acts. And so I had written them a letter and sent a resume if I could get in the public relations department because I had skills in journalism, anything. And I put on the bottom special abilities, comedy, ventriloquism. Wow. That got sent to the entertainment department. Then the guy, Mike Nett, called and he said, Mark, we'd like to offer you a job on the Mardi Gras because the ventriloquist who normally works on our ship has taken a break. And I said, who is who is the ventriloquist who normally works on your ship? And they said, Gary Hunter. Well, I hadn't heard of Gary, but as you know, Gary's on the program for this summer's convention. He's going to be the MC of the Saturday night show. I'm the MC yeah. of the Thursday night show. And so I, I had had a bad day cleaning teeth. And one of the dentists had told me that I was spending too much time on the phone booking these little shows that I used to do. And he said, you need to bear down and concentrate on dental hygiene. And when I got that call from Carnival Cruise Lines and the lady still sitting in the chair. <laughs> and I said, Dr. Connor, about that can't make a living as an entertainer. I had my mouth mirror in my left hand. I had the little shepherd's hook thing that you scrape teeth with in my right hand. And I said, Dr. Connor, I quit. And he was not happy. And of course the patient is still sitting there with the thing in her mouth uh, 42 <laughs> years later. I hope she's all right. And two days later, I was on an airplane flying to Nassau, Bahamas and got on board the, and of course Carnival didn't tell me that along with doing shows, I was going to have to do crew staff work, which that was okay. It, it meant that I had a microphone in my hand and was in front of people. Yeah. And I, I thank Carnival from the bottom of my heart for giving me a chance to hone my craft and, and to grow as a performer. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm very curious. So I know nowadays for uh, cruise ship entertainment, they have you send in like two, I believe 45 minute bits. What was it like when, when they had you, did they just, you had written them, written them stuff or did you send them anything that they could see you perform or did they just take your word for it and have you perform when you got there and they liked your, what you did and they had, they had you um, there long-term or how did that work? 1978 Landon was, was way before, I mean, I, video recorders were out, but, but home video cameras were prohibitively expensive. And the way you got jobs then, even, even in nightclubs, you had an eight by 10 photo and you had a brochure, which I had an eight by 10 photo, but I didn't have a good brochure, but Carnival just gave me a chance. And uh, when I got there, I did my first show on the second night. And again, I was 23 years old and I really had probably about 12 minutes of original material. The rest of it was from joke books, was from uh, ventriloquist books, whatever I was on. And so I went out and I did 25 minutes. And I mean, Landon, I did every joke that I knew. Mm -hmm. and, and I got, well, I had two seatings. If you've ever been on a cruise ship, ladies and gentlemen, most ships are two seatings, an early and a late seating. The first show I did on the TSS Mardi Gras on July the 16th, 1978, I went on stage following a singer. They had me close the show and I'm doing my act. And there was silence, Landon. There was silence. I could not buy a laugh. I was, I was sweating. I think I ended up having to throw that suit away because it was never going to be claimed again. It was wow. just annoying. And I came off stage almost in tears thinking I've made a big mistake. And the cruise director said to me, his name was Rex Richards. He said, good job, young man. I said, and I'm like, good job. 
I said, I, I died and I'm panicking. And he said, relax. He said, I should have told you the first sitting of the audience, this group is mainly deaf people, hearing impaired people. So, so they could read the lips of the singer and they could yeah. feel the vibrations of the music. But here's a guy with a puppet and they, they didn't know. So then, and this is the absolute truth. They had a sign language person who was interpreting and they came backstage and they said to the cruise director and to me, Hey, you know, you're good, but the deaf people are upset because they can't read your lips when the dummy's talking, <laughs> which is, <laughs> which is a compliment. Right. Right. And so I felt a little better about myself. And then I went on the second show and I did get laughs and I, and I, I felt like, okay, thank you, God, life is okay. And then the cruise director told me, he goes, you did a good job, young man. He goes, you know, you have another 25 minute show. And then on the last night you have another 10 minutes. And I don't know where I got the chutzpah from, but I looked at him and I said, I got lots more material. You know how much I had Landon? Zip doo da, zip doo da. Not yeah. the next day in St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands, I went to the Kentucky Fried Chicken and paid five dot five. So you get that in frame five dollars for just an empty bucket because I had a chicken puppet that just was a hand puppet and a routine right out of Colonel Bill Bowley's Talk to the Animals book. I did a whole routine with the chicken puppet and had a wooden egg and I stretched that out. And then the audience participation, I got people up to do do re mi. And I must have done that with five or six people. And I stretched that out. And I also had a gorilla puppet that I still have that was made by Steve Whitmire, the guy who was the voice yeah. of Kermit the Frog for a long time. Kermit. Yeah. And, and then by the farewell show, I thought I'm going to do a song with the puppet. And I went and got the lead sheet for the Dolly Parton song, Here You Come Again, which mm -hmm. is a great song to sing with a puppet. And yeah. And I was I was there for uh, two weeks and that was my trial. And at the end of two weeks, they came to me and they said, uh, Mark, they say you're doing a pretty good job that your show is coming along and that also you're good on your feet with the people, with your crew staff work. So we like to offer you an open ending contract and we're also going to give you a raise in pay. And I said, thank you, Jesus. And. <laughs> And I haven't looked back and I was on that ship for 10 weeks. And then they transferred me to the carnival, mm -hmm. two ships at the time, the Mardi Gras and the carnival. And then that ship went into dry dock and I went home and I didn't know what I was going to do. And then they called and they said, our new ship, the TSS Festival is coming out and we would like you to do the debut cruise. And uh, that was a real honor to get to go out and and entertain on the debut cruise, debut cruise of the festival. Wow, that's amazing. I love I love that story. Um, Glenn Pierce commented, he said, Landon, can you please ask Mark for his predictions about the future of cruise ship entertainment? Hi, Glenn. My prediction about the future of cruise ships entertainment is, I think, uh, not I think, I know cruise ships will come back, but I do think that it will be a different you know, these clear water bottles, you can put straight vodka in here. And no one knows the difference. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think it'll be a different game when cruise ships come back. Not so much as with the entertainment, but with the food service. And I think when cruise ships do come back, especially these huge mega ships that have 5,000 people on them, I just don't think they're going to sail with that many people. I think, I think there might be that many people who would be willing to sail, but I think they're going to try to fill them half mm -hmm. so that they can fill every other cabin. And I think they'll space people out in, in meal services. And I think as an entertainer, instead of having to do two seatings of a show, I think probably we'll have to do four, maybe five, because they'll want to space people out in the theater. I don't think they'll want to pack people in the theater. And I, I, I do think it will come back, but I think it's going to be a different game when it comes back until we A, get a vaccine or B, 
the herd immunity of this. But I think it's, I mean, I love working cruise ships, but cruise ships have, they're kind of a floating Petri dish of this. I mean, because they were for, for a little while, some of the largest outbreak of cases outside of China were on a cruise ship. So if that answers your question, Glenn, I think that entertainers will have to do more shows because the audiences will be smaller. So in order to reach everybody on the ship, you'll probably have to do more shows. I think there'll be less people on the ships to begin with. And I think the whole food service is going to be, I think buffets on ships, I think the buffets will still be there, but it won't be serve yourself. I think there will be a person probably serving you to, to minimize the points of contact. Sure. Wow. Um, we had another, I wanted to read off another uh, comment we had uh, from Michael Paul. He said, Mark had the sweetest land gig headlining for a review show at the Princess Hotel. I did. I did for four years. Hi, Michael Paul. And uh, much respect to you for your appearance on America's Got Talent last year. You yes. just nailed it, my friend. And your character, awesome. Nadia, when I saw you yesterday, I haven't seen you in a long time. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that things are going. So I've always thought you were a talent. And Michael Paul is another one that he he's always oh. stressed stand up comedy. He is a He's a he's a multi threat. He's so talented. I I hate his guts. No, I, I, I Michael is a great guy and I'm I'm honored to call him a friend. And yeah, it was a sweet gig at the Princess Casino. I worked there for four years in a review show. It's like a Las Vegas review. I might add that the money's all been spent and I was at the Princess Casino and Michael Paul was at the Lucaya Casino in a show produced by Greg Thompson. The show that I was in was produced by Jerry Jackson. And both shows were, and I think Michael would agree with this, our form of show business that, that probably doesn't exist anymore. The, the variety review show where there were yeah. singers and dancers in feathers and both shows that they were, adults had to go to them because the girls were topless. I mean, it, it, wasn't, no. it wasn't like a strip show. It was very tasteful, mm -hmm. but, but the production number just, pretty girls in topless outfits. And they, and they had like the show that I was in, I was the one specialty act and the show that Michael was in, he was the one specialty act and it was a great gig. And the best thing about that show was I got to perform twice a night, six nights a week. And I'm sure Michael will also agree with the fact that he got to perform that many times was, was so much fun. Yeah, Michael Paul just commented. He said, Mark is a gentleman and hilarious as a person. <laughs> well, well, yeah. he, Thank you. And then he said uh, that it was his first gig and that he misses the review show so bad and that uh, you were the uh, island star. <laughs> well, he's he's I don't know about the island star because the Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth, came to Freeport, Grand Bahama on some kind of official visit. And instead of coming to the Prince's Casino, uh, just because of politics, she she was staying at the hotel associated with the Lakaya Casino. And Michael Paul, even though he was not permitted to, he managed to get to meet the Queen. And he has a photo of he and the Queen because he was clever enough to grab a clipboard and look like somebody official. And, and I, I may have a few facts wrong, but... I didn't get to meet the queen. I got to meet I, Jimmy Carter. I read about that in his book, actually. What's that? I had, I had read about that story in his book. Michael has a book? He does. What's he it does. called? Um, I, what, I, uh, what I discovered from not being discovered. Is that right? Michael, what's, what's your book called? I, it, it's on my bookshelf, but I can't, can't, uh, can't find it. Let's see if I can go get it. He's leaving the scene now. It's now the Mark Merchant Show. Hey, there we go. I got a caller from Du Bois. Show business. I want a book. Oh, look at that! Breaking out of show business. What I've discovered by not being discovered. Can I can I buy that directly from you, Michael? And is there the friends and family discount? Because I haven't worked in six weeks. That's a good book. Oh wow! I need to. Yeah, it's great. It's got and it's um it's really neat because it's got a bunch of his uh, a bunch of different uh, showbiz stories on that. Oh. Uh, throughout the book. So it's great. So you can read one in a sitting and, uh, you know, or skip around, but it's, uh, 
I look forward to getting that book. Have you have you read a uh, Sammy King's book, Time on the Boards? I have, and I, I have. He he sent he had sent me a signed copy because uh, he's one of my mentors, and it's uh, phenomenal. Sammy King is a great guy, Michael. I'm proud of you. A book. I forgot you had a book. You know, I I need to, I need to get a book. <laughs> so this is interesting. So. Um, you would, you would sign with the uh, with this cruise line, and I assume you don't still use the same character that you had initially <laughs> used when you, or or do you? I'm curious. No, that was that the figure that I was using was um, a mayor figure actually built by Craig Lovick. Oh wow! And, and uh, I I had that figure until about 1994. I quit using him in '82 when I got a Conrad Hartz figure. Mm. And I sold it at the ventriloquist convention at the big group picture. I was standing next to a ventriloquist named Peggy Miller. And I'm, I'm looking at her puppet and I said, I know that puppet. That's a Craig Lovick puppet in the catalog. It was Chester. She said, yeah, that's Chester. I said, I have one of those. And she said, you want to sell him to me? And you know yourself because you're a figure builder. And, you know, you know, he was kind of part of me. But then I thought about it. I thought, he hasn't even been out of the suitcase in more than 10 years. And I said, Peggy, I'll sell him to you. And she, she took my snurdly Covington and, and she made him into a girl. She made him into a girl. She did the, she did the Caitlyn Jenner on him, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. That, so that was, that was the, I don't have that character anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't even have the, the Conrad Hart's puppet anymore because you eventually just, you can't keep everything. So right. the hard, the hard figure that I use now is a uh, Selberg, a Tim Selberg. I have, I have. Could you, a, talk, could you talk a little bit about how, um, why you, why you chose the just different characters and what ideas you had? Someone had mentioned earlier that they love your character, Alonzo Jackson. Um, could you kind of talk about where uh, you create, the, where your character ideas come from? Yes, I can. I'm, I'm sending my wife a text saying, saying bring me something so i hope she gets it you know if she's we're isolated from the house no we're, not, <laughs> we're in the studio uh repeat the question so i can articulate it. sure could you talk a little bit about uh a how you come up with character ideas and how you what was the the first main character that you created for your for your show on the uh, on the cruise line well the first character was typically a, a cheeky boy Snurdly Covington, and uh, he did, he did, and he was my alter ego. He really was. And and I had my gorilla puppet, Jojo, that was made by Steve Whitmire. And then I got a rabbit puppet, uh, just a stock rabbit puppet, also from George Schindler. Really? Okay. His name was Norman, and I dressed him in sort of a Caribbean outfit. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then the boy puppet Snurdly and Norman would do a routine together and they sang the Cole Porter song, Friendship, Friendship, Friend, perfect ventriloquist song. Mm -hmm. Then at the ventriloquist convention in, I think, 79, I bought an old lady puppet from Verna Finley, just one of her stock puppets. Wow. And I started using her some and then I realized that she could really, on the cruise ships, especially with with older guests, mm -hmm. that lady that lady character could could generate a lot of enthusiasm, and mm -hmm. all every character that I've created has been primarily driven by where I was working. Like when I was doing sure. China cruises in 1988, ten weeks of China cruises, I thought I need an Asian character, so I had one of the dancers on the ship. I took I was I was in China every week. Yeah. And I would lead tours, help escort tours. And one of the guides, I, I, I kept taking pictures of him because he had such a great, u unique face. And thank you. And there was a dancer on the ship who was an artist, and I got her to draw a cartoon of this guy. And the next week when I was there, I showed him the cartoon, and I, I told him what I did. And he could speak English. He didn't understand ventriloquist, but I gave him an example you know, just uh -huh. with my hand or, or touching someone's shoulder. And I, I told him that I wanted to make a puppet that kind of reflected him. And would he be comfortable with that? 
And he said, yeah. And then I gave him a hundred dollar bill so that he knew there was no exploitation. And, <laughs> and then I, off. Yeah. I sent the picture to Verna Finley, uh, a great golf sculpture puppet maker. Pioneered it for the ventriloquist world. Yeah. Absolutely. And three weeks later, Landon, a box arrived in Hong Kong and I opened it and I pulled the puppet out and I already had an idea of his character, but I hadn't named him yet. And the short excursion guy, a buddy of mine to this day named Jay Batten came walking by and he goes, Hey, wingtip shoe. I said, that's his name. And I started, I started using wingtip shoe. And as you know, yourself, you don't never with me have I just brought a character out and he just was a hit right away. You got to know the character. The character has to get to know you. You and so I was getting there, and then the Tiananmen Square thing happened, uh, the the protest in China in like 1989, and that kind of put the hiatus on any Asian character because I didn't want people to think I was making fun of that whole right. Master. And then I waited about nine months and then I started bringing wingtip out and a cruise director told me, he said, that's a great character, but you've got to stop walking on eggshells. The only way that that character is going to work is if you just get out there and hammer it. And so that's how I was, I was working in Asia and that's how that character came to life. Well, what I, what I love, is how Verna and and I was talking with Bob Rumba and and Jeff Golds in previous interviews, and we were talking about uh, having the character be based and where it looks has a cartoony aspect to that. And so I love how you how you sent that caricature into Verna, and she built it off of that. And um, I love to hear people's stories with Verna because I never got to got to meet Verna. Um, I'm friends with Marianne and and Melissa who have um, taken up uh, her legacy, but uh, it's it's truly neat to hear how wingtip came to be because that was going to be my second question for you um have you experienced when you talked about the whole walking on eggshells thing how did the material shift from what you were doing before i mean was it it was it just maybe you lengthened the bit that wingtip had was it you weren't as as worried about i was you talked about or i wasn't as worried about political correctness i i just by that time i realized the tiananmen square incident had happened. Hopefully it was in the past. And I always try to make my characters smarter than me. I never, the, the character was always make fun of me anytime we're, we're talking back and forth. Sure. And so I always tried to make the character, the smarter character. Mm -hmm. And like the, my Alonzo Jackson, which thank you, someone made a comment. My four years that I was working in the Bahamas, I had my Selberg puppet, which was, uh, he was still, I still use the name Snurdly Covington. That name went away in 1989. I was working in Reno, Nevada. I was the opening act for a country singer named Freddie Fender. And I was only doing 15 minutes and I was doing well. And Freddie said, what is, what's your puppet's name? And I said, Snurdly Covington. He said, what kind of name is that? I said, well, it's his name. And I said, but you know, I, and I had given thought because I, I, I kept thinking maybe that was a little juvenile. And by that time I was in my thirties. I said, I thought about naming him Sherwood because that's my middle name, Sherwood. That's my dad's first name, Sherwood. And I thought he's made of wood, Sherwood. And he said, I want you to call him Sherwood. When you work with me, he sure would. And so I was working for him. He was the star. I was just the opening act, 15 minutes. And I've learned in show business, keep the headliner happy. It's like happy wife, happy life, happy headliner, happy opener. And yeah. so I changed his name to Sherwood. And he was a custom made Tim Selberg character. Wow. And I still have him. And when I started working in the Bahamas, I had had a duplicate made because Selberg had made me, he had made two Sherwoods and he had made me, I have a bar stool that talks. That's a very unique character. Wow. And I, I also have a baby puppet that I acquired secondhand 
from a magician who has uh, since passed away, Tom Mullica. That was the first time I ever saw a Tim Selberg puppet was Tom Mullica had this baby puppet. But when, oh, I was wow. in, when I was in the Bahamas, Landon, a lot of the audience that would come, they were, they were Bahamians. They were, they were black people. There were a lot of African-Americans. And I thought, what about the contrast between Mark Merchant, a Caucasian, and a black character? How would that work? And a few people said, I don't know, Mark, I think that's a little bit risky because of the, the whole world that we're in. But throwing caution to the wind, I called Tim Selberg and I said, I'm sending one of these characters back to you and I want you to repaint him because his facial features were, he could, he could go either way. He could be trans. Right. Mm -hmm. so I had him painted to be African-American and I had his hair replaced with instead of Anglo hair, have, you know, African-American type hair. And I brought him out in the Bahamas. And the first time I brought him out and I named him Jackson, he was just Jackson. And then I thought he needs a first name. And my dad's middle name is Alonzo. So wow. I named him Alonzo Jackson. And he would be my second character that I would bring out. I would bring out my first character, Zelda Rose. I would do a bit with her. And then I would come back later in the show with Alonzo. And my opening line with him, I would say, I'm back. And Alonzo would go, I'm black. And... <laughs> And we were, we were off to the races. And uh, back in those days, I never had not even a smidgen of people worrying about the fact that I'm white and he's black because it wasn't a racial thing. I have, I have friends who are all different races and creeds and colors and sexual orientation. It's just two guys talking. Now, sometimes we would make jokes about it. Like he would, he would look at he would look at girls in the audience because in the Bahamas, a lot of tourists would get their hair braided. Mm -hmm. And I, I personally think it looks kind of silly for a, the only white person that ever looked good with braided hair was Bo Derek in the movie 10. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, Alonzo would look at some girl with braided hair and go, Hey, sugar booger, you got them braids. What's up? We get you a white girl. And it would always get a big laugh. And <laughs> I don't, and maybe I'm wrong. Call me old fashioned, but I don't consider that any racial slur. It's just no. making fun of the obvious. So I'm I'm curious, did the material that you uh, do with uh, Alonzo Jackson, was it ever was it any was it ever any type of like um, like black versus white type material? Or was it just like the material that you had already done, but you just put a, a Alonzo in the other puppet's place? No. My, my puppets land in rarely timeshare material. Material okay. that is Alonzo driven is for Alonzo. Material that is wingtip driven is for him. Zelda's material is for her. I mean, there might have been a few jokes that are generic jokes that are, are topical jokes that, sure. that either one of them could, could deliver. But generally, the jokes were specific to the character. So, yes, with, with Alonzo, I occasionally did do some not not black versus white humor, but just obvious jokes about uh, what the differences between sure, the elephant in the room. Right. Yeah, we would we would be in the Bahamas with a completely diverse audience of different colored people of all different races. And and mm -hmm. there I've got Alonzo and, uh, you know, I sometimes would would do material about uh like during the month of February, uh, I would tell Alonzo, I would say, it's great having you with me. It's February. As you know, this is Black History Month. And he would he would get upset and he would go, yeah, great. They give us the shortest month in the whole year. And then <laughs> I would do questions about black history and and things like that, that I would think he would know the answer to. Yeah. That's great. Um, we have some comments here. Steve Axtell said, love Tom. And then Bob Ramba commented he's, and said that he got to spend time with Tom when they were both in Branson at the same time. Tom. Um, looking back here. I'm not sure. It must have been, you must have mentioned it in passing. Um, so you had, you had talked earlier about the, uh, the baby uh, Selberg character. Yeah. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? And then you, you have it uh, with you, right? 
I do. I do. He's he's sitting just off awesome. camera in the uh, Merchant Studio here, the the fantastic uh, quarantine sound studio. Tom Mullica, for anybody who does magic or did magic, Tom Mullica was probably the premier close-up bar magician on earth. He yeah, that's who they were talking about is Tom Mullica. Oh, Tom, that Tom. Okay, sorry. Yeah, he had a bar in Atlanta called Tom Foolery, and it was it was a bar and it had a few seats. That, I think if it was packed, maybe fifty people were in there. And he was the show, and make no doubt about it, he was the show. Visiting magicians who would come into Atlanta, who would act like, "Oh, I want to come and do a set," he would go, "No, I'm sorry." This, this is my theater. Is get your own theater. And so I'd known Tom since I was in college and he sent me a few shows one time, you know, magic shows. Sure. And I would go and, 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 you know, if, if somebody sent me a show, I'd always send them a few bucks to commission. It's just the way things are done. So Tom did a little bit of ventriloquism. He had a rabbit puppet that was the same rabbit puppet that I had from George Schindler. He named it Duke after a great magician named Duke Stern. And, and Duke would do some, and Tom took the mayor of ventriloquist course. That's how he learned any oh, bit wow. of ventriloquism. And Tom also did a puppet that was kind of like a senior Wentz's puppet. It was his fist. Yeah. And, and he, and you know, he, he did, he put, decorations on it and he named it Miss Miss Fifi and he would do jokes with Miss Fifi and Tom Mullica is the first ventriloquist Landon that I ever saw who in his routine with Miss Fifi when they were singing a song they both hit the note at the same time and wow. it it blew me away and so yeah. after his show that night he said stick around I want to show you a new puppet that I have so after everybody had left and Tom, he lived at the bar. He had an apartment in the back of Tom Fuller. I mean, it was, you know, it's a show business dream to, to live there in your apartment. And then here's your bar. And here's yeah, Bob Rumba. Bob Rumba just said Tom was doing uh, red skeleton when I was in another theater doing Ed Sullivan. <laughs> uh, Rumba, you do a great Ed Sullivan. And by the way, you're Marilyn Monroe that year at the ventriloquist convention. I was I was getting a little I was getting a little excited just 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 FYI. So Mullica took me back into the apartment and he showed me this baby puppet that was just a, the the best wood card figure I had ever seen. He said mm -hmm. he's made by a new this was in 1981. He said he's made by a newcomer named Tim Selberg. And I'd never heard of Tim Selberg. Tim Selberg was an engineer. I think he worked for a faucet company. I think he helped design. So the baby was the first Tim Selberg character that you came to own? Yeah, well, he was. I, I came to own him later because Tom had, had. Oh, but it was the first one that you had seen of his in person. The first one I'd ever okay, seen. Wow. So then I met Tim Selberg at a ventriloquist convention in the dealer's room. And. His his stuff was, as you know, his his stuff is great and yeah. it's, it's always priced much higher than other figure makers because mm -hmm. it was so good, so state of the art at the time. And uh, that's how I ended up because I had seen the baby puppet and Tim would only make a puppet after he's he and you submitted drawings back and forth and you had already decided a little bit of the personality of this character. Sure. And so that that's how what an artist he is and yeah, so I love that. every time i would see or talk to tom mullica because tom mullica worked in paris for i don't know five six years at the crazy horse saloon doing his magic act he did an act where cigarettes would appear and he would he would appear to eat the cigarettes it was it was an incredible visual act nothing that i would want to do because i've never smoked anything but every time i would communicate with tom I would say, Tom, if you ever want to sell that baby puppet, I, I would like to acquire him. And he would laugh and he'd go, man, Mark, you always say that. Well, that was 1981 that I first met the baby puppet. 
Mm -hmm. Flash forward to 1997. I was working on a cruise ship with a magician named Johnny Thompson, the great Tom Sony. I know a lot of magicians will. Tom Sony passed away last year. He he did a comedy magic act called Poland's Finest Prestidigitator, where it was really a great magic act, but kind of kind of there was a basis of a of almost a Polish joke where his fly was open or he would produce a dove and the dove would poop on his nice tuxedo and things like that. But it was a great magic act. Mm -hmm. Well, um, Mullica and Johnny Thompson, the great Tom Sony were contemporaries and they were friends. And I said to Johnny one time, because I worked with him in Reno and I worked with him on cruise ships. And I said, listen, if if you talk to Tom Mullica, tell him I still would like to buy that baby puppet. And Johnny, <laughs> Johnny called me out of the blue in 1997 and he said, guess what, Mark? Mullica called and he said that he would like to uh, sell that puppet. And he said, you know, he's had, wow. he had he had many offers for it, but because Tom Mullica was a great guy, mm -hmm. he, he let me know that that if he was going to sell it, he was going to sell it to somebody who had expressed an interest in it from a long time ago. Sure. And so I called uh, Tom up. He was in Las Vegas. And I said, listen, I still would like to buy the baby. And uh, I, I won't discuss money, but I paid him twice what he paid for it, which, wow. uh, you know, the fact that a ventriloquist puppet appreciated yeah. in, well, in value 100 percent was a good thing. And, and Tom was nice enough. He said, Mark, I know that's a lot of money. Do you want to pay it off in time? And I said, no, I, I actually I actually borrowed money from my daughter. <laughs> oh, wow. It's her birthday today. Tracy, Tracy Osborne is 47 years old today. Happy birthday, Tracy. Happy I'm, birthday. I'm, I'm, I'm really her stepdad, but I don't I don't like the whole step dad daughter connotation. It, it reminds me too much of, of Cinderella or something. Why is this? I want to be in the center of the frame. Well, I, I will say this. What's interesting about the baby character that you have versus, um, you know, any other baby hard figure that I've seen, even so, even the one that Selberg sells uh, uh, on his website, is that it's got it's a lot cartoonier. It's got a bigger head and bigger cartoony hands as you'll as you'll uh, bring it out in the in a second. It's really uh, it's a really neat and uh, interesting design too. Yes. This is this is him with his COVID nineteen protective. <laughs> Actually, it's the a I baby I, bag. I think I bought this uh, padded thing from uh, Tom Ladshaw. Oh wow! Oh wow! And and he's oh for you kids out there, an adult diaper is great padding for the for the kid's head. And and I I don't. Uh, I don't wear adult diapers. Yes, you do. I don't. Get in the camera. Hi. Hi. It's Landon Harvey. Oh, wow. Wow. Hi. Look in the camera. Okay. And like you said, he does, he does have, I mean, look, look at the detail. He, he and carved, the thumb. He, yeah, the carved his hand so that it's wow. like his, his thumb is uh, like he's been sucking his thumb. And oh, wow. wow. A little. A little, wow, on the camera, it's got a little abrasion there. Uh, thank you, Spirit Airlines, for being so careful with him. Uh-huh. Yeah. So he's been, he was recently reconditioned by uh, Chance Wolf. I'm sure you know mm -hmm. Chance. Yeah, uh, he, he I, I believe, I don't know if he's still on here, but he, he tuned in a little earlier and uh, was watching us. And I, I actually had him uh, repaint one of my, my only a uh, hard figure that I use, and he redid the mechs. So yeah, I'm I'm very familiar with Chance's work. Yeah. Well, this this guy, uh, Baby Big Ears. Uh huh. His name is Stanley. Yes, yeah, Stanley. Because that that's the name that Tom Mullica had given him. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, wait, wow. Did you see the Did you see the lip control challenge that uh, that Dennis uh, Dennis Daniels had put up? Daniels. Yeah, I need to submit something to that. <laughs> I went and got a pizza. What kind of pizza? A mellow mushroom pizza. My lips aren't moving, but but my sixty-five-year-old neck is popping around like. <laughs> I, I dressed up for this. This is so exciting to be performing, ladies and gentlemen. I'm available 
for parties, bar mitzvahs, anything. And I don't, I don't have a book like Michael Paul, but I do have, I do have a DVD slash Blu-ray called I'm Happy. And uh, that's available on my website, markmerchant.com. Markmerchant.com. And I'll send you one, Landon, for free because I like you. Oh, thank you. And you also get, but wait, there's more. Just pay separate shipping and handling. You also get a custom-made Mark Merchant talking coin purse. Hi. Oh. <laughs> That's great. A little bit of a lag there in the... Hi. We've got a website on the back. Oh, it's <laughs> the comedy of... Uh, There we go. The co comedy, two voices in one, markmerchant.com. That's, That's awesome. Right. That's right. And Mark needs a manicure. <laughs> the nail salons just opened in Atlanta yesterday, thanks to our uh, genius governor. Mm -hmm. yeah, how do you socially distance and get a manicure? <laughs> I saw, I had seen, I had actually seen uh, someone put their hand through the uh, mail slot on someone's front door. And get a manicure. <laughs> I think that was flowing through Facebook. So I guess it can be done. Um, but yeah, he's a great, he's a great character. I love, I love everything about him and his, his big cartoony eyes. And then the ears are hilarious. Um, I'm curious. I'd love to uh, pick your brain on how you fly with these characters, what your process is. Um, this character, baby big ears, Stanley, uh -huh. he always goes in my carry on. Because if 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 worse if the worst thing that can happen to a ventriloquist happen, which would be me get to the gig and, and none of my puppets arrive, if I've got baby big ears in that carry on bag, I could do a show with baby big ears and I I would the necessity is a mother of invention land and I would work to make it work. I would have to 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 acquire a few of the jokes that some of the other puppets use and just just make them sure. work with this puppet. But cannibalize the bits, yeah. Thank cannibalize, yeah. Thank you, thank you, God. Uh, puppets have 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 gone places that I haven't gone, but they've always shown back up. Uh, that's you know, it's 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 the it's the bane of existence of anybody who makes a living working with props and characters. Yeah. Whether you're a magician or a juggler or a ventriloquist, especially if you're a ventriloquist, because you're. I know when I watch that roulette wheel of luggage go around and around. I'm like, come on, Seven, come on to my, your head is going under there, under, under the Mark Merchant name. <laughs> you're, not, you're not used to the camera, are you? There's the camera right at the top of the MacBook. Is this, is this, I hope this transmission is okay. This is an older MacBook Pro. This is a MacBook Pro from 2011. And as you know, the Apple stores are not even open now. And the last time I took it in, they said they were not permitted to work on it because it was considered legacy or vintage. Wow. Yeah, we can we can see and, and hear you great. Um, that's that's a great that's a great figure. Thank you for thank you for showing him. It's really really neat. Have you ever had one of those uh, had one of those scary stories with uh, luggage or where you're flying and Something like that's happened. Yes, yes. Can you I, share one with us? Absolutely. The most recent one, and I hope it is the last one, Landon. Mm -hmm. I was joining a ship in uh, Jakarta, Indonesia. And if you ever get the chance to go to Indonesia, pass it by. <laughs> <laughs> Not easy to get to. I yeah. flew Atlanta to Kennedy, Kennedy to Seoul, Seoul to Jakarta. At the Seoul airport, the officials from Garuda, Indonesia, which is the official carrier of Indonesia and part of the Delta Sky team, they said, we don't know where your luggage is. I was flying business class. It had all of the proper priority tags. And when I got to Jakarta a day early, I was spending the night and I, I, I could not sleep. And the next morning I went to the airport and they said, and, and 
especially with Asian people, if you lose your temper, if you get upset, you're not going to get anywhere. You have yeah. to, this is part of their culture. You have to be kind. You have to be calm. And so finally, two officials from the airline came and said, Mr. Merchant, your bags are here. And I went run into the other side of the baggage claim area. And there two people came out with my two suitcases and I did my Tim Tebow. I got down on one knee and put my hand up and I said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> a flight oh, from Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. And there was a whole group and, and I'm not slamming the Muslim faith. Whatever your faith is, is fine with me. Here's a whole group of Muslims all in the in the Gutras and the Burkas. And here's a skinny white boy going, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and it was almost an international incident, but I got out wow. my life and my puppets. So thank you, Jesus. Steve, <laughs> Steve Axtell just commented and, and he said that uh, he said, I've manufactured puppets in a Jakarta factory. <laughs> oh, good. Hey, ask Steve Axtell. I want to get my eagle puppet, which my eagle puppet, Jose Diego, the illegal eagle. He is a, he is a hybrid Verna and Axtell. And when I saw Steve, the last time I saw him at a ventriloquist convention, I said, I need to one, get my original one fluffed up. And two, I need to get a new one. So tell Steve in this COVID breakdown, if he's still, wants to do that for me. I uh, think he's still, I think he's still in, in uh, doing, doing, working on stuff and, and shipping stuff out. So Steve, get in touch with Mark and, yeah. uh, and uh, let him know. Cause he's, uh, he needs some uh, Eagle, Eagle repair. My Eagle, my illegal, my illegal Eagle is, where did, well, there's, there's a poster for my show. When I do shows at communities, bringing the funny, the comedy, of Mark Merchant and there Landon is mm -hmm. my is my eagle that is Jose Diego awesome and that awesome. what Landon. what part of him is Axtell and what part is Verna the body is Verna okay and, and the beak and the eyes and the the talons his uh his his talons. Oh, neat. Those are, and of course, the arm is an Axtell arm, and he he is one of my mainstays in my show right now. I love this picture. To be. I love this picture because when I the last time I had a a a photo session, when I was leaving, I just had Zelda Rose in the car, and the photographer he said he said wait let me get this, and he just snapped that picture. That's me leaving the photo and Zelda just kind of leaning over. And, and that turned out to be the best picture of the whole shot, I think. What I love about that is it, it, it calls back to what we're talking about with contrast. And I love how, how, how she's like, feels like she's having to put up with you. Like yeah. I love, like you get so much, so much ideas from what the relation, what your relationship with the character is just through the poster. And I love that. I was talking with Bob Rumba, uh, uh, not too long ago we did an interview and he was talking about the importance of uh, getting photos done where there's an action or some type of um uh, scene within the photo and so like, that's that's really neat that you that you have yeah. that um, like steve so steve axtell said that you can uh, contact him uh through steve at axtell.com okay steve axtell you're the man that you know i'm glad that he and they are working right now this when when you said that bob rumba said that this photo Oh, that's great. It was taken on a uh, an NCL cruise by a guest who was on the front row with a really good camera. And he, he asked permission. He said, do you mind if I take some shots of you? I said, no, as long as I can just get them on a, a flash drive. He said, yeah, my pleasure. And this is a picture actually of me performing. And I think it really, it's, it's on my business card. Yeah, that's great. There's my phone number. So, uh, in case I get crank calls in the middle of the night. <laughs> and it's a, a business card in promotion. A comedian named Court Proctor told me one time that a vertical business card gets a better response. So my business card is two sided. There's there's. 
but I always hand it to people like this. But then when they turn it around, they're forced to do that. So they're already, they've got something kinesthetic going on. Yeah. I got some investment into what you're, what you're showing them. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Thank where did you. the, where did the uh, Eagle idea come from? The Eagle idea came about, I, I, that, that Eagle puppet started out as a chicken puppet when Verna, really? when Verna okay. made her and, uh, the chicken just didn't work for me. And so I thought I was doing a lot of Alaska cruises. And again, it's like when I worked in the Bahamas, I came out with the, with the black character. When I was working in China, the Asian character in Alaska, a lot of bald eagles, more bald eagles than any other place in the United States. And I thought, why not get a bald eagle and have a bald eagle and I'm, I'm tip, have a bald eagle with a comb over, you know, it's like he, he's got on a hat, obviously, in the in the photo there, mm -hmm. but his hat comes off and he's got he's got a comb over and yeah. he does he does a couple of jokes about about being a bald eagle and and then a, a man who works for my wife and I who happens to be a Mexican guy whose name is Diego Zamudio he did the last time we had our house refurbished he was the contractor. And one time in a stroke of creativity, and when they come, you got to grab them. I thought, Diego, yeah. I could name my eagle Diego, as in the eagle, the eagle. But I called him Diego. And so I would, I would bring him out and I would say, uh, what is your name? And he would go, my name, Jose. And anybody who's old enough would go Jimenez because there used to be a comedian, Bill Dana, who would do this Cuban character. My name, Jose Jimenez. And I say, I say, what's your name? My name, Jose. And people would yell Jimenez and the puppet would go, you're showing your age. And I would say, no, what is your last name? And he'd go, Jose Diego. I say, oh, Jose the Eagle. He goes, no, listen, Jose Diego. I say, oh, Jose Diego, D-I-E-G-O. So. That's how that puppet came about. And uh, I said, but you're, you're in a North American Eagle, the symbol of the United States, and you have a Latino accent. He goes, so I am an illegal Eagle. You can build your wall, Mr. President. I will fly over it. And then I will. <laughs> and so that, that's, it was part of the immigration thing. And yeah, I, I tend to, I tend to like topical material. I tend to like political material, but I, I work both sides of the aisle. I, nobody can accuse me of favoritism and nobody's going to pin me down about who I care for politically because it's not relevant. I'm curious with the whole topical material, how, when do you realize that a, that a, a joke or uh, the, the topical material that you're, that you had put added to your uh, bit, whatever puppet bit it is, it's gone stale. Like when do you start to feel that? And when do you, will you edit it or will you just totally take it out? Or will you just kind of keep it, file it in your mind for something to check for in the next show? How do you kind of address that? I totally take it out when it's when it's when it's run when it's past its expiration date. And mm -hmm. it, it's interesting, Landon, how things go. Sometimes a topical joke will last longer than I think it would be topical. But for example my my lady character that's on the poster here zelda rose mm -hmm. when she comes on on stage now i bring her out and i say good evening and she first thing she says is in a deep voice she says hello i'm bruce jenner and it, <laughs> it gets a huge laugh and again i'm not making fun of the transgender community it's right a joke and yeah. I, I keep thinking, okay, I'm going to know when that joke is past its prime. But the fact that it gets such a great laugh and it's not mean spirited. So, you know, you know, a joke about like, like after the Super Bowl, I was doing a couple of jokes about things that happened during the Super Bowl. And they had like a, a lifespan of maybe 10 days. And then people right. aren't talking about the Super Bowl anymore. Mm-hmm. So, but then when you're, you're too young to remember this, but 
there was a televangelist named Oral Roberts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, have you heard of that name? No, I don't. <laughs> he was a big time televangelist, faith healer. And in 1987, Oral Roberts told his congregation, his television congregation, that that if he did not get a certain amount of money in donations that he felt like God was going to call him home. Now, personally, I think that ultra manipulative of people's feelings with their faith. Right. If I don't get these donations to my church, God is going to call me home. Well, anyway, he ended up getting the money. So I came up with a joke with my rabbit puppet. By that time, I wasn't using a the George Schindler rabbit. I was using a rabbit that was custom made for me by Verna Finley, great mm -hmm. little rabbit puppet named Norman. Mm -hmm. And Norman would come out of the suitcase and especially around Easter, I would say, who are you? And he would go, I am the Easter bunny. I'd say really? He goes, yes. And if I don't get so many chocolate eggs, God is going to call me home. And it got a, <laughs> and that laugh, I was able to do that joke probably for about nine months. And then I could just wow. tell, I could tell that people no longer cared about Oral Roberts and his manipulation of getting people to send him money so that yeah. he wouldn't die. In fact, the, the joke that people would tell would be like, did you hear Oral Roberts die? They go, really? Yeah. Turns out the check bounced. Anyway, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, David Pendleton said, I remember uh, Oral Roberts and remember that story. And Steve Axtell said, talk about the Joel Osteen puppet, which is great. Um, and I, I love this character of yours. I'd love to hear the story behind it. Uh, but I'd like to I'd like to mention the puppet real quick. It's got this really funny feature. It's super cartoony where it's teeth versus having a sneer. Um, they like drop down. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. His, yeah. His teeth are not. If Great I had, guy. yeah, I would, but I know this is a show about the ventriloquist, as you said, not as much the character. The, the reason the Joel Osteen character came about Landon is because uh, the mailman who delivered mail in the suburb of Atlanta in which I live, when I would be walking my dog, this is a few years ago, he would always say, hey, Mark, you know who you look like? I'd say, who? He said, you look like Joel Osteen. Well, I'd never even heard of Joel Osteen. I hadn't. Yeah. So I dialed him up on the computer or whatever. And I saw Joel Osteen and with his, with his coiffed hair and his big smile and his nice tie. And, and I could do the voice pretty well. Thank you. God bless you. It's a joy coming into your home. It's a better joy coming into your pocketbooks. Thank you. <laughs> I thought I should get a Joel Osteen puppet made. And I will say it's one of those things that I, and it's a great puppet made by a great puppet maker, Scott Land. Mm -hmm but it, it has not been the success that I thought it would be. I debuted him in Houston, actually Austin, Texas at a magician's convention. Now, Joel Olstein's uh, church, Lakewood church is in Houston, Texas. It's a big, he's probably the biggest Protestant minister in the United States, maybe in the world. And he's headquartered in Texas. And so when I brought him out, Right away, he got big laughs and I did like a five minute routine with him and I killed with every line. Every joke yeah. landed. And I thought, man, I got a money in the bank thing. And then when I take him on cruise ships or other venues, first of all, Joel Olstein is not as well known as I thought he was. I'd bring him out and some people wouldn't know who he was. Some people would think because he's got a long face and a big chin, they would think I was doing a caricature of Jay Leno. Other people thought he's a caricature of me, which is, so I, he is a great character, but I, I've yet to, I've yet to get my money's worth out of him. And if things don't pick up in show business, he'll be for sale at the ventriloquist convention. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. I, uh, earlier back, I believe it was uh, Darren Carr had asked, um, are there, were there any characters uh, that just didn't work for you, that you had tried out and it just didn't click with maybe the audience or you couldn't, the characters didn't fit with what you had in mind? Uh, I can think of three examples. One, the chicken puppet. It was a great puppet that Verna Finley made. And I don't know if it was just, I just didn't have a routine or 
I, as a, as the ventriloquist, I've got to create the character. And as, as I'm acting out the character, I kind of have to be the character. And I really don't know what a chicken feels like. I don't really know what a bald eagle feels like, but, but the whole illegal eagle, I thought I can work with that. So the chicken puppet didn't work. Another one that, and I still had, is a great looking character in Barcelona, Spain at the zoo years ago, the only albino gorilla in the world was in the zoo there. His name, wow. his name was Snowflake. In Spanish, it was Copito de Nieve, which means flake of snow. Mm -hmm. And so I had this albino gorilla puppet. I had one that Steve Axtell made for me. And then I had another one that Verna Finley made for me. He's a great looking puppet. Wow. But, and I've, I've, seen, I've seen pictures of the Verna one. And the, the sculpting on the faces. Yeah, yeah. I, I used him at some school shows and he did do well at some school shows. But when I would use him sometimes for adults or on cruise ships, and I'll never understand this, people would get upset. They thought that I was doing a racial thing because he was an albino gorilla. Had nothing to do with race. He was an albino gorilla. He was the only one in the world. And so that didn't work. And the, the Joel Olstein puppet so far has not worked. That didn't mean that, that he won't work. I will say, Landon, when I've done some shows for senior groups at churches in the Atlanta area, and I would bring out Joel Olstein, mm -hmm. he would work. But I've yet to I've yet to make it where it's where it's more than a five minute hunk of material. It's just like sure. a little bit. Sure. That's interesting. Um, in, in kind of wrapping up here, I'll, I've, I have a few more. Uh, questions for you. How would you break down uh, the percentage of time you spend on the different areas of of being a comedian ventriloquist? I know there's always performing, but there's so much work that goes into that before you even uh, meet the stage um, through whenever you. So how much, how much time in preparation or how sure, much? Like, and what 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 areas of preparation do you do before you you uh, you uh, see the stage lights? Well, I, I work on my lip control every day, maybe mm -hmm. not every day in quarantine, but, but I do, I, I think lip control is very important. And I, I love the Dennis Daniels lip control challenge, but I also do vocal exercises and I make a point of sitting down at this very computer that is now televising this mm -hmm. and working on material because kind of the theory that if you put chimpanzees with a typewriter, that maybe something good will come out of it. If I can write two hours a day and get one good joke or one good idea, I'm ahead of the curve. And I also, I, I have employed writers over the years who have written stuff custom made for me. And, mm -hmm. and I, I'm the I'm the ultimate editor. The, the buck and the joke stops with me because I'm the sure. guy who's going to present it on stage. Right, so, it has to feel like it's it's your style and something the character and you would say. Right, like on a on a show day on a cruise ship. I mean, I practice every day, but on a show day, I am laser focused because it's like the old uh, adage: "Dance with the one that brought you." What brought me to that cruise is my skill as a ventriloquist. The fact that I've been blessed with this talent. So on a show day, I don't care if my wife is with me on the ship or. My mother, my father has traveled with me, my brother, my sister on a show day, kind of leave me alone because I am focused on that show. I, I have a routine that I'll get up at a certain time. I'll exercise. I'll look over the outline of my script. I'll know where I'm going to slide in some new material. If something happens that day, that's like, like I was on a cruise ship in 1997 when uh, Mike Tyson had that boxing match with Evander Holyfeld and he, he bit him, he bit his ear in the boxing match. And I came up with this joke and I did it that night. I've got my puppet, but, but I'm, what I'm saying is I wrote this joke down and I had a place where I could slot it in, in right. some of the things that I knew would work because mm -hmm. they're, they're not standard jokes, but they're jokes that are part of my routine. And I don't want to just come out with a new joke, but like I put that joke in where uh, I said something. I don't remember how I set it up, but I said something to the character. He said, oh yeah, I've been working on this material. I've, 
I've got one of those new Mike Tyson computers. I said, a Mike Tyson computer? He said, yeah, it comes with one megabyte, which <laughs> megabyte, which that's hard to say without moving your lips. Now, yeah. I'm, looking, I'm looking at the screen here. Terry Rogers, a ventriloquist who passed away, she used to say one way to make your lip control better is put a tiny bit of lip liner, just a tiny bit on your top lip. Because when you move your mouth, you're moving, you're moving your mandible. See the mm -hmm. dental hygienist, you're moving your lower jaw. Yeah. So if you're doing ventriloquism and you're, okay, how are you not? If there's a little bit of color right there, just a little bit, not, yeah. not so much that you look like a drag queen, but hey, if that's your thing, knock yourself out. Right. Just a little bit, it, it'll call attention to that. And then if you if your lips do wiggle a little bit, hopefully people won't see it. Wow. Wow. That's great. Um, I have this I have this last question for you here. And thank you for the, taking the time out of your um, your quarantine schedule. I'm not sure what that <laughs> entails with you as you as you're probably writing and, and still trying to keep the all your characters alive through this time. But um, what do you hope to see from the future of ventriloquism? Uh, the future of ventriloquism, I think, looks bright from, from wonderful performers like Darcy Lynn and like yourself and um, the other young man that I saw on your show recently. What he, I've seen him in the youth open mic. Oh, him. Jeff Goltz. Yeah, yeah. And then there's also uh, Max Fulham, who's in uh, the UK. Yeah, yeah. Ma oh, Max was uh, this past ventriloquist convention in 2019, mm -hmm. I was there and I was under a little bit of duress because my wife's father had just passed away. He was 91 and it was oh. sad, but my wife said, go to the convention, Mark, because I've got so much to do and you'll come home and it'll be time for the memorial service. So I was sitting in the showroom for the international show that Friday night mm -hmm. and you know, you're not supposed to use your cell phone in there night because you'll get, you'll have to pay money. But a text came and it was my wife saying, Mark, I need to talk to you. So some things are more important than a ventriloquist show, like talking to your wife when she needs to talk to you. Yeah. So I left. And when I came back, everybody said, you missed the highlight of the convention, buddy. You missed Max Fulham. And I'm, I'm sorry I missed him, but I think the future of ventriloquism is, is bright. I think that, uh, regardless of all the audio animatronic and computer generated things, I think the skill of being able to bring an inanimate object to life, even if it's one that that's more, I think people are always going to like that. And I, I think that, yeah. I think that, that Max and yourself and uh, Jeff, is that his name, Jeff, the, mm -hmm. yeah. the that, that you guys are the, are the Jeff Dunham's and, and Jay Johnson's of the future. I think that it's, I think that it looks great and I'm, I'm glad to be a part of, and I can't believe that here I am at 65 dispensing advice because did we, you weren't at the convention this past summer, were you? No, I had taken the year off. Okay. Yeah, and, I usually and, am, but uh, I hope the convention happens this summer. Uh, I know, I know I got the Facebook message from Mark Wade that it's supposed to happen, but a lot of things can happen. But yeah. I, I had heard, I had, I had tuned into a live he had done with Al Gettler. And apparently it's still on unless something, you know, some other word happens. I think they're waiting on to see from the governor in uh, Kentucky and what he says. But, uh, you know, if, if they still have it, I'll be there. So good. Well, I look yeah. forward to seeing you. I'm, I'm supposed to MC and perform on the Thursday night show. Uh, I've been I've always been on the Saturday night show, but I think. I think that they feel like they need to keep me on a, a shorter chain because I, <laughs> I tend to, I tend to do what I want to do, but I always yeah. have, fun. but I hope the convention happens, but I do know that the, the big magicians convention, the international mm -hmm. Brotherhood of magicians in July, it's been canceled. The largest magic convention in the world, magic live in August has been canceled. So I, I hope the convention happens because I'm looking forward to it. And I hope that yeah. the, Hope the world heals from this COVID-19. Uh, one thing about being quarantined, my wife, who is not on camera, she's doing something productive now. Uh, I told her today, I said, Cindy, 
it's great being quarantined with someone that I love. And she said, yes, aren't you lucky? Thank you, sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, Mark Merchant, thank you so much for taking the time out of your out of your day to uh, be part of this interview. Uh, it was great. It's great getting to talk to you and catch up and to hear your story and how you got into this art. Well, hey, thank you. I I, I, I hope that I met your expectations because uh, I would definitely. I'm I'm a real fan of yours of your of your work, uh, both as a figure maker and as a performer. And I'm glad that I was able to hook you up with uh, my friend Holly who was in the uh, Miss Virginia contest and uh, yeah. she was looking for a new character and, and she does a great job with it. She just passed she the does. bar exam. So I don't know if she'll be in any more uh, contests or not, but she, Oh, she, wow. She That's does. Awesome. Job. Yeah. So hi, Holly, if you're watching this, I owe you a coaching <laughs> session. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys for tuning in and uh, for asking the questions on, uh, on Facebook and, uh, We'll have this interview. I'll I'll repost this on my on my YouTube and then post it on my Facebook so you guys can always go back to it and I'll be there.